Our next speaker is Yossi Moalem. He is a professional programmer with over 15 years of experience, mostly in C and C++. Right now, he is a team leader in Cyberbeats EDR, so Endpoint Detection and Response Division. He is passionate about sharing his knowledge, and he's also obsessed with refactoring and performance. And uh, he's so obsessed with performance that even one of uh, his wife's pregnancies was delivered three months earlier. Unfortunately, the... the <laughs> All of them. Oh, uh, unfortunately, the uh, source code was not released, so he couldn't debug it. His talk today is titled "Cache Consistency and the C++ Memory Model: Writing Code to Real Hardware." Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing: if you have any questions, please uh, wait till the end of the talk. It's kind of your dream, isn't it, to have the source code for your kids? So. The baby is crying, you just, oh yes, it's teething, let me just prepare a hotfix for them. And it's like, done and dusted, no need to worry about anything. Kind of give new meaning to programming for humans. So I'm Yossi Moalem, uh, and this is where you can uh, contact me. So when we program, when we went to kindergarten and learned about computers, they all told us that you have a CPU and you have a memory huge chunk of memory, and the CPU just talks to the uh, memory. And that's it. And life was very, very simple. That was maybe the case a few decades ago. And life was simple because what it insinuates is that the compiler just translates our code into machine code, and the CPU just runs whatever we tell it to run. And then it can go on more. The problem with this is that it was very, very slow. So what Moore's will say, we all know Moore's law that says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles every two years. That's a lot of very, very long words. It's back, it basically means the CPU became much, much faster, and it did it very, very fast. Unfortunately, it did not speak about the speed of memory. So what we see on the graph here is the different speed that, that started to, be, to build between the speed of memory and the speed of CPU. So if uh, it takes us like one or two cycles to execute an instruction, but something like 200 cycles to fetch it, it means that 99% of the time, the CPU will just sit there, this is like crossed, very happy, just waiting for instructions. So what we'd really like to have is an infinite amount of very large amount of very, very, very fast memory. Unfortunately, that's not possible. It's not possible, first of all, because building very, very fast memory is very expensive. Secondly, the amount of memory that we want to have, we simply cannot physically build so much very, very fast memory. So instead of having very, very large amount of fast memory, we have hierarchies of memory. So we have a very small amount of very, very fast memory, followed by a larger amount of slow memory, still a larger amount of still slow memory. And instead of having this mental model uh, that we program for, we have something closer to this. That's a bit close. It's not to scale, but it's kind of closer to what we actually built for. Now, I keep saying that it's slower and faster and big and small, and it's a lot of hand waving. So let's look at some figures. L1 cache is the fastest cache that we have. I think it takes something between two and four cycles, which is really, really fast, but we have very, very limited amount of it. Maybe the number here are not so accurate, maybe you have a bit larger amount, but the ratio still remains. We're talking about 32 Ks, it's within the Ks that we're talking about. L2 uh, is 15 to 18 cycles, slower, still relatively fast, but we have only 256 cycles of it, uh, kilobytes of it. L3 takes 30 to 40 cycles, and we have few megas, 32 megas in this case. And the main memory, which we have a large amount of it, but it can take oh, 200 uh, cycles to fetch from. So we have all these figures, but it doesn't really say a lot because it's just figures, so I plot it into a graph. So we see this very, very small li line, L1, followed by this huge main memory cache. But I still don't see you very impressed by this. So I added some pictures to illustrate something that we all know. So if L1 cache is a sitting down giraffe, 
the main memory is the Empire State Building. And it's still not it. It still doesn't really convey just how slow it is. So I actually created a, an animation to, actually created this kind of big word. I asked my wife to create me an animation for it. And the look on her face when she saw how excited I am because of it is like, you're such a sad person. Now that's the scale. This is the scale. This is our main memory. This is the RAM that we have. It's not something that swapped to disk. That's actually the r accessing memory from the RAM. Now, while we're waiting for the memory to arrive, let's just say that most profiles will count this time that the CPU is just sitting there waiting for the memory as CPU busy. So if a profiler tells us that we have 100% CPU busy, it may be that it's actually doing work 1% of the time, and the rest of the 99% of the time is just sitting there waiting for this light blue ball to arrive. And it's nearly there, so let's wait for it. It took her a lot of time to make it for me, so let's give it the respect. <laughs> and it's nearly there. No, yes, we got it. That's the scale, and that's the RAM. It's not swap to disk. So what does it tell us in real life? The, the talk is uh, called writing for real hardware. It's not like theoretical. So if we want to scan a matrix, we can scale it row by row, column by column. I believe that everyone here will not be surprised to see this graph. Row by row, it's contiguous memory. It's much, 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 much faster than column by column, which you always have to jump. The question is, is column by column the worst? And by asking this question, obviously the answer is no, because otherwise it would be like kind of stupid question, isn't it? So no, if I go randomly, it's actually a lot, a lot worse. And why is that? When I'm going uh, column by column, the prefetcher works. The prefetcher just sees that I'm taking this byte, and then I'm going, for example, 1,000 bytes further, taking a byte, 1,000 bytes further, taking a byte. So it kind of knows, let me think, what would be the next byte that you'll want? I know, 1,000 bytes from here. So just prefetch it for me. When I'm going random, it cannot help me. So the gap that we see here between the column by column and the random is just the work of the, of the prefetcher. We keep hearing about the prefetcher, but we never really saw just how much it does for us. The second question that we have to ask ourselves is why will we scan a matrix randomly? Well, actually, there's not a lot of reasons for it. And it's kind of stupid to scan a matrix randomly. But think about all your non-contiguous memory containers. List, map, set. That's what they do. Think about your contiguous memory, but when you're storing pointers or references. Yes, the pointers and the references are contiguous in memory. But we normally don't just look at the pointer themselves. We want to dereference it. So the object themselves that they're pointing to is randomly spread across the, the memory. So w once again, what we, what we are actually doing is randomly accessing it. We're actually doing it a lot more frequently than we'd like to think that we're doing it. Now, what will happen if I change the metric size? I don't know if you noticed, but I'm using here 1,025. Now, 1,025 gives us a hint that it's not a randomly chosen number. It's just one above 1,024, isn't it? So what will happen if I will change it to 1,024? We'll do a bit less instruction. So we should be a tiny bit better, shouldn't we? Not really a measurable amount, but we definitely should not be worse. And this is the results. When we're going row by row, it's about the same results. When we're going column by column, we're actually doing worse. We're doing less operations, but we're doing it in more time. And in order to understand why, we have to go a bit deeper into the way that, that cache works. So what's our requirement from the cache? We want swapping in and out to be very, very efficient. We definitely want a very fast lookup. We want to minimize maintenance, obviously. The cache needs to be non-consecutive because different cores use different uh, applications and they need different memory. But even within the same core, we're accessing different segments of, da of data. But we still want some locality because if I'm using this address, it's very, very likely that I'll want the one after and the one after. In order to support this, we have the 
we introduced the term uh, cache line. Cache line is a fixed size of memory. It depends on the architecture. The architecture se sets the size, and that's it. It cannot be changed. And that's the smallest cacheable unit. We cannot talk about caching anything smaller than a cache line. When a memory is required, the whole cache line is swapped into the cache. So if, for, for example, here I need the byte marked with x, its whole cache line is going into the cache. When we're, doing it, when we're talking about cache lookup, every cache line is marked, let's say, with a color, just to make it a bit simpler. So if, for example, I, and all, every cache slot has its own color. So if I need this cache line, I can, I can store it in only in the yellow cache lines. So let's say I stored it here. Now I need this cache line. I don't need to, to check the whole cache for this memory. I only need to check the yellow slots. So I see that it's not there, and I'm putting it again into the, into the yellow slot. So what happens in the, when I reduce the size? 1024 was carefully chosen to use the same slots over and over again. So the prefetcher does not have a lot of places to place it for me. Let's say that you have four slots. It's called four associativity. So it can only bring me four cache line in advance. So I'm really limiting how much the, the, the work the prefetcher can do for me. And if you'll see, it's very, very close to the random uh, results. All of this was about, about uh, single-core. When we're talking about multi-core, we start to have the notion of false sharing. I believe there is a lot of talks about false sharing, so I'm not going to explain it from the be beginning. I am going to explain what it is, but there's plenty of materials on the net, including my own talk in Core C++, if anyone is interested in a bit more details. Core sharing means that two cores, or few cores, are not sharing the actual data. There is no contention on the, on the data. We don't, we're not talking about race conditions or anything like it. Every core has its own data, but the data is located in the same cache line. In order to have false sharing, we need to have several cores accessing the same cache line frequently, and at least one of them needs to be a writer. We normally talk about, uh, about false sharing in the context of array, but it doesn't have to be array. It's any memory. It can be a uh, heap allocated memory. It could be global, static, anything, even in, in different rotation units. What's more important is the layout in memory. They need to be close to each other in memory. So let's see again how it affects us in real life. We want to have a very lightweight counters. Something, we have many cores, we have many counters, and we want to have it lightweight because it's in our hot path. So the very naive implementation would be to have one variable for each counter. So we have counter 1 for CPU 1, 2, and 3, counter 2 for CPU 1, 2, and 3. Each one is writing for its own variable. There's no logging here, there's no contention, there is nothing, right? Let's measure the performance. Now, in order to measure the performance, the way that I chose to do it, I think that it's the most simple way, is each thread is doing a predefined set of iterations. So if I have n threads, the total will be that I'm doing n times the amount of work that one thread will do. If I'm doing a million uh, iterations, then six, then not six, 13 threads will do 13 millions. I measured the result bet between one core and 31, and I calculated the slowdown. Now we expect the slowdown to, it cannot be smaller than uh, one. Right, because still every thread needs to do the same amount of work. So the best case is that they don't hinder each other, and every thread will just do its work regardless of what all the other threads are doing. And that's low down of one. It takes exactly the same amount of time for five threads to do the, the work than it takes to one thread. But we, and we also expect that the worst case would be n, because if, uh, if we do it sequentially, Five th one thread will do its work, then the other thread, then the other thread, it takes me, if I have five threads that's doing it, to take five times the time that it takes to one thread, right? So I actually measured it, and this is the result. 
Please note that when we have 16 cores, we are 50 times slower. I know that my accent is not very good. I said 50, not 15. 50 times slower when we're doing just 15 times the amount of work. Now, why is that? Core 1 updates its uh, own counter, all good. Core 3 updates its own counter, still everything is good. But now Core 1 has to update its data again. But Core 3 has invalidated the cache line. Core 1 will now, it cannot just update its counter. The cache is invalidated. So it will swipe in the whole cache line again just in order to update it. So instead of updating the counter that takes, just incrementing, it takes two cycles, we're not talking about something like 200 cycles. So a very easy solution for this is let's, no, let's not turn off the monitor, that's not the solution for this. <laughs> let's group them by cores. So core one will update its counter, Core 3 will update its counter. Core 1 can then update its counter. They didn't invalidate each other. Life is good. Result is also a lot better. We're now not talking about 50 or 60 times slower. We're talking about 15, 16 times slower. It's a lot better, but it's not really what we aimed for. They don't share anything. Why should we not get one? Constant one. Let's have another look into it. I marked here, I framed here a cache line. So core one updates its counter, core three updates its counter, core one updates its counter, different cache line, all good. But now core two updates its own counter. And that invalidates the, ca the, cache, the cache line. And now when core one will want to update its own counter again, it will have to fetch the, the cache line from the beginning. So what we can do is just add some padding. I just had few bits, few bytes that, that I don't use, and each core has its own cache line. Can it make a difference? Okay. Can it make a difference? This uh, bar at the bottom, it's not the Excel, it's the actual result. So I focused a bit into it, zoomed into it, and that's the result. Up to 27 cores running at the same time, we hardly have any, any slowdown, less than 1.5. Now this can be the difference between counters that you can put in your hot path and not worry about it and have it running all the time to counters that you really, really, really need to think about. Can I really run them? It will slow, it, it's either negligible slowdown, negligible effect, or very severe effect. So yes, I spent here a few bytes for alignment, but it's nothing. I mean, we all wrote much more complicated code that generates a lot of machine code just to save a lot less than this. We got from slowdown of 50 to slowdown of 1.5 by very few uh, changes. Now, we saw that the layout of the data and the way that we fetch the data has a very big impact. So the compiler really, really wants to help us. And in order to do it, the compiler has freedom. The compiler can change the code that we write. The compiler can rearrange or even remove memory accesses. It can reuse location. So if I'm using one variable in one part of my function and I don't use it later and from this point I'm using another variable, it can reuse the location. It can even not store variables in memory at all. I think that we all saw it when we have a for loop I++, it can be just stored in, in register. It doesn't need it in memory. It does it to get better locality and to use, better use this, the, the hardware to reduce the amount of stale cycles. 
The only restriction that it has is that it has to maintain the same of the original observable state from a single thread point of view. And that's very important. It's from a single thread point of view. It's called the is f principle, as if you understand what it means. But the fact that it's single threaded is very important here. That's a C talk, so we have to have compiler explorer in this talk. So here it is. What we have here is something very, very simple. It's just we know we want to publish a message, so we put message to publish equal row message. We null the row message and mark a flag. Even without understanding assembly, we're just looking at the colors, we can see that the first instruction that the compiler emits is setting the flag. Now, if another thread is looking for this, uh, for this flag and monitoring it, it can see the flag set before we set the message, which is obviously not good. Now, the first thing that comes to mind to most people is, OK, let's put volatile. In order to understand why it's not a good idea and why it's not a good idea, we have to, I think that we have to understand why volatile was introduced to the language. Volatile was introduced in order to, sup to provide support for memory mapped I.O. So if, for example, I have my network card and I'm accessing it, I can't just rearrange, I can't just say, I want to read the header and then the body, but the compiler, nah, you really will. I really will read the body first, then the headers. It just won't work. It cannot, if I say that I'm writing something, it can't say that, OK, I'll write it in a different order. So reordering volatiles between volatiles is not allowed. But there's nothing stopping the compiler from reordering volatile and non-volatile. If I'm writing or reading from the network card, it doesn't matter what I'm doing else in my program. So this will, first of all, it will restrict the, the optimization, not only for this part, it's every time that I'll use these variables, it will, I have to mark all of them as volatile. And every time that I'll use them, I'm limiting the amount of optimization that the compiler can do. And as we'll see in very few slides, it's not even a comprehensive solution. So the real solution for this is to use memory barrier. Memory barrier is this line in the middle that says uh, atomic signal fence. And what it means is everything above the fence has to, s to remain above the fence. Everything below the fence has to remain below the fence. And as you can see, the order now is correct. If you notice very, very cl closely, we first uh, put, uh, nullify the row message and then put message uh, to publish. But it's really not that important because who cares? Now, the, CP the hardware has some freedom, too. The CPU can reorder our instructions in order to use several functional units and in order to execute instructions while it's waiting for the previous operands for the previous instructions to arrive from memory. The CPU executes it. It doesn't really execute it in the, the way that the instructions are written. It's more the data availability order. And this way, it reduces the, the amount of time that we have to wait for the memory. So let's look at a very simple example. We have here uh, one core that sets answer to 42 and mark a flag that's finished. That is where it just monitors the, this uh, flag and then writes the answer. Let's say that the compiler did not change it. The CPU may reorder them. And if the CPU may reorder them, we may mark the flag finished before we set the answer or we may read the answer before the flag was finished. So we have two threads, and they need to communicate. Threads communicate by sharing data, sharing memory. So we must be able to reason about the ordering of reads and writes. And that's this, the idea of the memory model. It's a set of allowed reorders. If you're allowed to order load and load, load and store, and so on. And more importantly, how to limit them. So if the, f the tool chain sees a fence, it must emit the correct uh, instruction in order to support this fence. And if it does not have this instruction, it must issue a stronger fence. We distinguish between two, two kinds of fence. Full fence means literally anything above has to be visible before everything on the bottom. Nothing can flow between, move the, around this fence. One-way fence means that certain instructions are allowed to move up or down, while other, while 
other instructions are not allowed to move, and you're not allowed to move in the other direction at all. Until C11, C did not have a memory model at all. And all the synchronization mechanism that we use, mutex, semaphore, and so on, already have the required fences, so we don't need to worry about it. We only have to worry about it when we use lock free uh, algorithms. So the uh, C memory model uh, is described as CSDRF. CS is sequentially consistent. Sequentially consistent means that the result of any execution is the same as if the read and write occurred in the same order and the operation of each individual process appeared in the sequence specified by its program. There's a lot of words. What it basically means that if I have one thread that does A, B, and C, and another thread does X, Y, and Z, I can see A, B, X, Y, Z, C. I can see A, X, Y, B, C. But I can't see B before A. I can't see Z before Y. No real hardware will support it because it would be just too slow. That array means simultaneously accessing an object by two threads, and at least one of them is a writer. Simultaneously means without happens before uh, relations. And we'll talk a bit about it a bit before. Now, I said many, 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 many words. I'm sure no one understood a thing of what I just said, so let's just play in English. What the memory model says, the C++ memory model says, is that it will appear to run the program as we uh, that you wrote, we won't may maybe we won't write, but it will appear to run it as long as you don't write data races. So let's look at this example again. Now, as it's insinuated by the uh, use of store and load, finished is atomic. So A1 is sequenced before A2, B1 is sequenced before B2. The load in B1 synchronizes with the, the store on A2, and they establish a happens before relationship, which means that when I get to the, to the C out answer, I'll read, I'll see the correct answer. I'll see 42. Let's just look at, uh, at it in a different way. I have now one thread doing uh, this, one core doing the left side, and one uh, core doing the right side. So the first time that uh, we execute the, the loop, it falls. We don't see the finish is not flagged. Maybe it didn't uh, execute it yet. The core did not execute it. So we go for another iteration. Maybe now the, the core uh, marked finish as store, but this core still does not see it. The fact that we use atomics does not mean that we'll see it instantly. We now see it. It means that it uh, established, uh, it happens, uh, it's the, this load synchronized with the store. So what it means is that any operation following this load will see, for example, this operation, will see any operation before this store. Does it make sense? It's also trans uh, transitive. So what we see here is that A1 sequence before A2, B1 is sequence before B2. The load in, sequ in uh, B1 synchronized with the store in A, in A2. So B1, B2 will happen before A1. Similarly, C1 will, sy will synchronize with B2. And because C2 is sequenced after C1, it will happen after uh, B1, which happened after B2, and the assert will never finish, will never fire, sorry. This is one of my favorite ever examples. I first saw it in Jeff Pershing's blog, pershing.com. I saw it since then in some other blogs, but this is the first blog that I saw it, so credit goes to him. It's also an excellent blog, very uh, recommended to read. We have four variables, x, y, r, x, and r, y, they all initia initialize to zero. We have one thread that initializes x to one and then set r, y to y. The other thread uh, sets y to, to one and r, x to x. Take a second to convince yourself that when both threads are finished, there should be no case where, I where r, x, and r, y are both zero. One has to happen first. The only way for Ry to be zero is if it happens bef 
before y was set, but then rx would be zero, and the other way around. Right, there's no sequence that will generate both of them to be zero. So what we really want to do is to run it ver m very fast, many, many, many times. So just a spawning thread for every, every run is not very feasible. So what we have is this pseudocode. What each thread is doing, thread one and thread two, is what we said. They're waiting for the start semaphore to be signaled. Then they're doing their work, and then they're posting that they finished. The main thread initializes all the semaphore, responds to thread that we just described, initializes everything to zero, and posts on the start semaphore. Then it waits on the end semaphore and check if both Rx and Ry are both zero. And that's the result that I've got. We see that although it should never happen, it does happen. And the reason I like this example so much is because this runs on x86. x86 really does not do a lot of reordering. But still, even in this uh, very, very strong architecture, we can still see the effect of reordering. Now, fixing it is very, very simple. We just put a memory fence between them. And demonstrating would be kind of boring. Nothing will happen. It will never fire. I want to talk a bit about non-sequentially consistent atomics. The first one and the easier to explain one is relaxed atomics. The one thing that we know about relaxed atomic is that it provides us atomicity. There will be no tone read or tone write when we use a relaxed atomic. But one thing that's sometimes overlooked is that it also guarantees us that read, modify, write will always see the latest value. So doing plus plus on an atomic from two threads, even if it's happened on exactly the same cycle, will generate the correct result. However, they did not provide any sort of ordering. So if, we, if, we, if in this example we use memory order relaxed, we, they, uh, the load and the store do not establish a synchronized with relationship, and this is again a data race. The second, uh, the next one is acquire release. They must work in tandem. There's no point in putting acquire without a release or release without an acquire. They have to work together. Operation sequence before the release would be visible to operation sequence after the acquire that synchronizes with it, but it does not provide global ordering. Again, many, many words. Let's see an example. In this example, it's very, very, f it's very, very simple. It's exactly like the first one. We still have the sequence before. The load acquire will synchronize with the store release, and it will establish a happens before relationship. But everyone keeps saying that non-sequentially consistent atomics are very, very hard. And we saw here that it's very, very simple. Why? So why everyone is so afraid of it? Let's look at a, a different example. There's a lot of words here, but it's not really that big uh, an example. I have two writers here. Each writer one just sets x to true, writer two stores true into y. Nothing really amazing there. Reader one loops until x is set and then check if y is set. If y is set, it sets this flag both sets to true. Reader two does exactly the opposite. Checks if y is true, and when y is true, after y is true, it checks if uh, x is true, and then it, it sets x to uh, the flag to be true. And we want to make sure that the assert will never fire. The idea is that if, uh, if uh, reader 1 did not set it true, it means that x was set before y. And if x was set before y, then reader 2 must change, must fix it, right? Must set the, the flag, right? However, in this case, if we'll use acquire release, it will not work. We must use sequentially consistent in this example. 
So because it doesn't because acquire release do not provide global ordering. So not only that we have to think about what happens when things happen in exactly the same cycle, we don't even the, the two threads do not have to agree on the order. So it really raises the question of what does it mean that it happens first? What it means that X was written before Y? Is it the when it was executed on the CPU? If a CPU did an instruction, no one sees it, did it make a noise? Sequential consistent man mandates a single global order. Relaxed atomics do not. And that's the, well, th that's the hard part of them. We, have to th we don't have like an order to the program. Two threads can see different order. One thread can see X and then Y, and the other thread can see Y and then X. Now, most talks will say, don't ever use them. They're just too difficult. But we are talking about C++, so we have to squeeze some extra cycles. So I say, let's look at Before you th think about it, does it really, ever, every microsecond count, is it really on the hot path? If it's not on your hot path, don't bother with it. It's just not worth it. Do you know that this error is problematic? Measure, make sure that the sequentially consistent is what's slowing your program down. Can you have massive testing and a lot of reviews about it? And massive testing and not mean, yes, we're releasing in one month, QA will, will, will uh, check it. No, we have to stress it a lot to change, to build a tester that will make a lot of contention of these variables and will really, really test it. And you have to test it at least on all the architectures that you're releasing to. At least. If you have some other architecture you can uh, test it on, it's even better. But it's not uncommon that something will work perfectly well on x86 and will crash to pieces on power, for example. Is it a known pattern? A lot of the patterns that we use are known. Stop flag, uh, reference counting, just any counting. It's known patterns. And then we can just copy the, them. But when you copy, don't just copy. Understand the reasoning of and the assumption of the relaxed atomics. Understand what, what was the intent and why it works before you're copying it. Now I want to, whoa, run of time. Now I want to talk about some considerations of designing your software. So let's, talk, let's look at this uh, class. Okay, we have some object, it has position, it has speed, it has some sort of model, it has the name and it has foo. Which is the most expons expensive operation in this small snippet? Let's count. Reload pose, it's a cache with 200 cycles. Reload speed, it's in the same cache cycle, so it's three, ci three cycles. We multiply and add five times, uh, twice, so it's five cycles, twice. We then square root, 30 cycles. Reload foo, it's a cache miss, another 200 cycles. Then we add it to the result, one cycle. Total, one, 450 cycles. Can the compiler help us here? Only 50 out of the 450 cycles will, will work. Now, the compiler is not allowed to rearrange our data layout. And the compiler has very little control about the data fetching. So really, the only thing that the compiler has to deal with is these 50 cycles, which is not very much. If we move a few lines up, let's count the, the cycles again. Well, let's not. It's all the same without the cache line, the, ca the second cache mesh. So 250 cycles. That was changing the layout a tiny bit, almost half the, the cost. But can we do better? Most time we'll do something like this, right? We'll just iterate through all the objects and update it. So let's regroup the data. We'll have the model, but all the things to deal with the position will just tear out. So now we won't have to load the whole model. We'll just load the position, just the data that we'll need. And that would be consecutive. 
So in a single cache line, we'll have multiple objects. So the cost of fetching it will be shared between all, between the, the ob between all the objects. So in average, the fetching will cost us something like 40 cycles, so we reduced the, the cost to about 90 cycles. So data-oriented design in one sentence is, it basically means that, that any program that we write is just meant to take data from one uh, representation and do some modification and transfer it to another thing. So we want to really want to make a contiguous, tightly packed chunks of memory that will use it consecutively. So we'll regroup the, the data fields, not according to the abstraction. It doesn't matter that it's all a car. We'll group it according to its use, according to its needs, according to the transportation, that transformation, sorry, that we're going to do on it. Let's look at another example. We have a uh, container of objects and we want to operate on just some of them that, ma that have a certain key or satisfy a certain condition. Now every time that we fetch the full-blown object, no, we don't need it. Fetch a second one, no, we don't need it. Fetch a third one, no, we don't need it. And it's a lot of wasted fetching. But if instead we'll just take the key out, we'll just load the keys, we'll just load the information that we need. And whenever we need to operate on the, on the object, only then we'll load the full object. When we're iterating on an, uh, on an object that has a lot of booleans, when we're just checking a boolean, it's like the worst that, can, that we can do. We're loading a full cache line just for one bit. That's like the poster child for polymorphism, isn't it? We just have a vector of shapes and we call draw on each one of them. Problem here is that shape it's very likely it will be a square, circle, polygon, then a square again, they text again, rectangle again, rectangle. So what happens here is not the data that we talk about now, is the instructions. We load all the instruction for a square draw, use it once, then ditch it, load all the instruction for circle draw, ditch it, polygon draw, ditch it, and then we load again this the thing for, for square. So we don't really use the same instruction that we, that we fetched before. So we don't take advantage of the, of the instruction cache. If instead we'll do this, we'll group it according to the, to the actual uh, object that we're holding. We'll first uh, draw all of our, of our circles, then all of our squares, and the instruction cache would remain hot. We'll keep using the same instructions over and over again till we really don't need it. As an added value, uh, we can devirtualize draw. And it could be a static call, which is also a bit faster. The only problem with this is that, is that we lost the order here. So if the order is important, that will not work. But in many cases, when we just need to update, the order is maybe not so important. Let's say we read some sensors, and if everything is good, we do some non-important work, and if, if, if something is wrong, we have to do something that is really performance critical. Chances are, we'll try read the sensors, all good, do the non-important work, all good, all we'll do uh, again the non-important work, all good, and so on and so forth. When we do need, when the important, when the sensor is not good and the performance is important to us, only then we'll go into the branch that is important to us, that, is, that the performance is critical. Now this is really, really bad. One way to tackle this problem is uh, to fake this event. Every now and again, we'll just fake that something bad has happened so we'll fetch it and run the, the, the critical code. And in the end of it, we'll just do, OK, but don't commit it. Don't really do the work. If you need to send something over the net, in the network card, we won't send it. But this will keep 
the instruction cache for the critical path of us of that we need it will keep it hot probably the last thing that I'll talk about today is cache oblivious algorithms when we talk about cache oblivious algorithms I don't mean that they're oblivious to the cache existence I mean it oblivious to the cache characteristics we know that, there is, that we have cache but we don't know its characteristics and we attempt to maximize the amount of cache hits that we have now because we don't know the cache uh, characteristic if we maximize it for one cache we'll maximize it to all the cache that we have cache aware algorithm can outperform cache oblivious algorithms but that's assuming that we know all the cache uh, characteristics that we have so if we having if we ship our software with the hardware fine we can optimize it to the to the cache that we have because we know it but if it's general purpose that we just ship the software we, we cannot know the cache uh, characteristics so we can't really optimize for this for this cache when we come to analyze the the utilization we still use the big o notation but we assume idealized caching model we ignore cache hierarchies we ignore replacing policies we ignore associativity and it can still be proven that it's still within the constant for more for the realistic uh, model so let's look at an example we want to search a sequence of number for the highest number that is less than x we can assume that the data is searched many 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 times so we don't really care about the preparation time we can take a lot of time to prepare the data and then we'll search it many times so how can we store the, this sequence because we don't have a lot of time I'll, I won't ask you this question the first thing that most people say is binary search binary search will use log n comparisons and giving the distance we can assume that each uh, search would be a memory access it's actually a bit less we're talking about log n minus log b memory accesses that will require which is not really the best because almost every time every item that I'm uh, fetching I need a new cache line I'm in cache miss b3 is much better we'll just add the b to the cache line and it will require log base b, base b of n steps each one could be loaded within uh, one cache miss so it will require log n divided by log b memory accesses but we need to know b so that's a problem so a full description of the algorithm that I'm go that I'm gonna describe is beyond uh, the scope of this talk but the idea is that we'll set a fully balanced tree and recursively divide it into subtrees then we'll store each subtrees into sequential memory and use that to search so if you have for example this tree we divide it into subtrees it doesn't look like in this program but in this picture but they're all the same size they're all the same height and we keep dividing it and then we'll use this to store so if I have for example this subtree I'm keep dividing it and then I'm storing it in contiguous memory so every section is contiguous in memory so let's just have an intuitive uh, analysis of the of how many cache misses we have each section is of size b or less because we just kept dividing it so it will require two memory accesses every section height is log b between log b and log b divided by two because it's a tree the tree height is log n so the maximum sections that we'll need to visit is log n divided by log b divided by two and we said that every every section will require two memory accesses so we'll require maximum of for log n divided by log b memory accesses it's not as good as the b tree but it's in the constant it's much better than the than the binary search now this is a backup thank you we have another 10 minutes so we can either uh, use these 10 minutes for questions 
or I can uh, go. I have a few more slides that I want to give, and we'll have, but we'll have a lot, uh, but we'll have less time for questions. What do you prefer? More slides. Okay, so we all know a uh, singleton. I'm not going to describe why to use singleton because I don't know why to use singleton, but let's assume that we want, for some mysterious reason, to use it. The problem is that this code is broken. It assumes that we'll allocate the memory, call the constructor, and then assign it to instance. But as we know, the instruction can be rearranged. So the first thing that comes to mind, OK, let's use a temporary variable. However, the compiler can optimize it. So we want to start from the computer. I won't go into all the details here. We can try to use static variables or put it in a external or we can really really try very hard to outsmart the compiler but it's not really a good idea because the compiler normally is smarter than us we can try to use volatile everything should be volatile the instance and the single and the temporary variable but this will not work either because an object is only volatile when it's fully constructed it's a bit weird to think about it when we talk about volatiles, but if you remember that the rules for volatiles and for constant are the same in the standard, then yes, obviously, an object cannot be constant before it's fully constructed. So if I'm putting like one line from the constructor here, it's in line, this can be reordered again. So that's also not a good idea. So that's maybe the most important thing. Trying to outsmart the compiler is a really, really bad idea. But we know how to tell the compiler not to reorder. We just put a compiler barrier here. But what about CPU reordering? That's a game over. But we also know how to solve this. We just replace the compiler barrier with a memory barrier. Is this OK? Hint, if I'm giving this question, obviously it's not OK. <laughs> Instance is not atomic, so no one really guarantees us that the assignment of temp to instance will be atomic. So instance also has to be atomic. And this actually works. Problem is it's sequentially consistent, and we said that sequentially consistent may be expensive. Can we do better? Well, yes. If we use acquire release, I'm checking with the choir, I'm setting with release. When I'm just testing, I can test it with relaxed because I'm inside the, the lock. So that works. And that should be, that's, a, that's faster. It's not should be faster. That's faster than the previous version. But do we really need the lock? Let's look at this one. I'm just checking temp. If temp is null, I'm just creating the singleton already. And then I'm using compare exchange strong to set it into the instance. If I failed, it means that someone beat me to it, and someone already set instance to its own copy of my singleton, so I delete it. It's very important to use compare exchange strong in this case. I'm not allowed to fail, to spuriously fail. So this is another uh, option. But if you look back at uh, C++, what C++ guarantees us, starting C++ 11, what all this says is that static variables inside a function are guaranteed to be thread safe. They're guaranteed to be initialized only once. So it basically means that Myers Singleton actually works in C++ 11. And that's the real thank you. <laughs>